We're here to worship God, so let's hear what God's Word says to us. The Word says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. God takes delight in his people. Let us take delight in him as we sing to him, using the words of Psalm 44. And in Psalm 44, we're going to sing stanzas 1 to 6. O God, we with our ears have heard, our fathers have us told the work you in their, their days once did, even in the days of old. Stanza 6, but you have saved us from our foes, our haters put to shame. In God we make our boast all day and ever praise your name. And this evening we're going to be looking at Psalm 85. Psalm 44 is in a fashion a companion to Psalm 85. And in Psalm 85 we're going to, sing, we're going to see that God takes delight in his people. And in Psalm 44... God's people say that they take delight and they boast in their God. So let's express that as we worship God this evening, boasting in God our Savior and singing to his praise the words of Psalm 44, stanzas 1 to 6.
let's come before God in prayer. Sovereign Lord, great God in heaven, we come before you this evening as your blood-bought people to boast in you and to rejoice in hope of your glory. For you have been pleased in outstanding grace to extend to us the blessing of your own life. And you have blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. And you have set before us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And these things we have not achieved for ourselves. Our sword, and our bow did not win the land for us, but you won it. It is your doing. It is your gift. And so we boast and rejoice in you this evening. We boast that we know you, that we know the Lord God Almighty. We know the one whose delight it is to exercise justice and mercy and steadfast love upon the earth. We boast in our knowledge of the Father. We boast that we who are only flesh and blood, and here for only a few short days, we whose lives amount to very little and whose lives are stained with so much sin have nonetheless been adopted by God the Father and made sons and daughters of the living God. And so we name you our Father and we boast in you this evening. And we boast in our knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We boast of the one who loved us in eternity past, whose joy and delight it was to receive us as a promised gift from his Father, and who in time was incarnate by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so that for our sake, he who knew no sin should become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we boast in him and we rejoice in our knowledge of him. And we boast in our knowledge of God the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, the one who's been sent by the Father and the Son to make us children of God, to grant to us the experience of our adoption, to cry out within our hearts, Abba, Father, to enable us to walk in obedience as sons and daughters ought to, the one who brings to bear upon our conscience and into our lives your discipline, discipline that you exercise within us because you love us. God, the Holy Spirit, who is the very essence of our inheritance and so has been sent to us as the down payment and who separates us from the world and marks us out as belonging no longer to the evil one, but belonging to God himself. We boast in him and we rejoice in our knowledge of him. And we ask, gracious God, that this evening our boasting in you would match your joy and delight in us. That just as you look down from heaven upon us and smile and shed upon us the radiance of your goodness and your grace, we ask that our hearts would open to you this evening with an answering joy 
and gladness and satisfaction. And that through the ministry of the Word this evening, we would be more and more weaned away from our desire for this world, our desire to find permanence and meaning and satisfaction in the things of time. And so as we rejoice and boast in you, we ask that you would show yourself glorious and holy among us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 85. Psalm 85 is going to be our text for this evening. And we're going to read the whole psalm together. Psalm 85, from the first verse. Let's hear the word of God. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins, Selah. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation." I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Amen. And we trust that God will follow the public reading of his word with his blessing. Let's sing again, this time using the words of Psalm 126. And using the, singing the whole psalm, Psalm 126, the Lord brought Zion's exiles back as men who dreamed were we. Then laughter filled our mouth, our tongue did shout in victory. Then they, they then among the nations said, the Lord great things has done for them. The Lord great things has done for us. Our joy has come. The psalm is another sort of companion to Psalm 85 with its mention about the restoration of the exiles. And here we also get hints of God's pleasure in his people and the pleasure that God takes in the restoration of his people. When they're far away from him in exile, and they're off in exile for a reason, they're in exile because of their sin, their rebellion, their disobedience. But God has such pleasure in them that he brings them back to himself. What a great God this is. What a gracious and kind God we worship. So Psalm 126, the whole psalm. Let's stand and sing to God.
So our text this evening is Psalm 85, and the message I want to bring to you from this psalm concerns God's pleasures, God's pleasures. The very first word of the psalm says, you took pleasure. And the psalm proceeds to build on that and to tell us about three things that really, really please God. Three things in which God takes pleasure. But it does so in the context of Israel's sin and punishment. And it's hugely important for us to take that on board. Because one of the lies that sin tells us is that what God really takes pleasure in is being hard-nosed and tight-fisted. That He is a critical, controlling, ungenerous God, as expressed by the servant in the parable of the ten minas, who said to his master, I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Again and again, Scripture presents us with God as superabundant in His generosity and magnificent in His kindness. That God does not hoard His life for Himself, but that He shares it with us. That He doesn't suck up the product of our labor, but that He gives it to us for us to enjoy. Again and again, the Scriptures present us with God as greeting us with a bright and a sunny face, that God meets us with a spreading, diffusive goodness. And yet, because of sin, we find it hard to believe. In fact, because of sin, we want it not to be true. We would rather that God was hard-nosed and tight-fisted. We are by nature actually like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal, the older son who refused to rejoice with his father in the recovery of the younger son. We are often, because of sin, rather like this older son who dared to criticize his father as one who was controlling and ungenerous. These many years I have served you, he complained, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And that's the lie that sin tells us, that God is severe and penny-pinching and someone to be afraid of. Avoid God at all costs. That's what sin says. And so this evening in Psalm 85, I want you to see that the Scripture paints an entirely different picture of God as the God who takes pleasure in forgiving and restoring and recovering peace with sinful people. Because these are God's pleasures. So God's first pleasure, the pleasure that gets headlined in Psalm 85, is His creatures. God takes pleasure in his creatures, which is why he forgives our sins. God takes pleasure in his creatures, which is why he forgives our sins. Lord, says the psalmist, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger.
Israel's experience had been just like that of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were expelled from God's land. When Israel persisted in sinning, Israel was expelled from God's land. The word translated fortunes, as in the fortunes of Jacob, is built on the Hebrew word for taking captives. So it really means the captivity of Jacob. And the picture is that of raiders who have come into God's land, and they have taken the residents captive, and they have taken them out of the land, and outside the land they have sold them as slaves. So like they are now doubly removed from God's land. And so to restore the fortunes of Jacob is to secure the release of the slaves and the liberation of the captives and to bring them back into the promised land. The question we want to ask is, why ever would God do that? If the people had defied his will and defiled his land, and if they had been expelled as a result, like Adam and Eve, being expelled from the Garden of Eden, then why would God ever go to the trouble of restoring the captives and bringing them back? And the answer given by the psalm is that this is God's pleasure. God loves his people. He loves his creation and he loves his creatures. You see, the word favor with which the psalm opens, hardly a strong enough translation for that word. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12, this word favor is equivalent to the love that a father has for his son. And can there be any greater love than the love that the Father has for the Son? The Father looks in the Son with joy and satisfaction. And he says, with you I am well pleased. Favor is love. And it's that love, it's with that love that God originally loved his creatures. Creation was an act of joy and delight on God's part. And as John Goldingay says, when things went wrong, the same delight was also the reason why God did not simply turn the other way. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God takes pleasure in his creatures. Only his pleasure is not indulgence. Sin has been committed. And when sin is committed, God cannot simply turn a blind eye to it. And so it's hugely significant. Again, that that first word in the psalm, the word translated, you were favorable, is also a sacrificial word. The Old Testament law about sacrifices made it clear that the purpose of the well-made sacrifice was to be received by God with favor. And when God received a sacrifice with favor, the person presenting the sacrifice was forgiven. And so our psalm goes on to use sacrificial language. It says, Lord, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered over all their sin. You withdrew your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Clearly, wrath and hot anger are the polar opposites of favor. But to avert them, God had to cover over the sins that the people had committed. And God had to see to it that the sins were carried away because that's what the word translated 
forgave actually means. The sins were carried away. And that's sacrificial language. Because sin is confessed over the sacrificial victim so that the victim now carries it, not the sinner. And the blood of the sacrificial victim is poured out and it covers over the sin so that now the sin, sorry, the, the blood, in other words, the death of the victim that carried the sin is what is seen by God. And the psalm says, that's something in which God takes pleasure. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so we see that in the psalm and in John 3, 16, forgiveness is not something that is wrung out of God. Forgiveness is rather God's loving and gracious gift. God truly loves his creation and his creatures. And God is not indifferent to our condition. It matters to God. It matters to God that we have been taken captive by sin and death. And God loves us and delights in our restoration like the father of the prodigal who rejoiced that his lost son had been found, that his dead son was alive once again. Like that father, God takes pleasure in forgiving. And because he takes pleasure in forgiving, he has provided the sacrificial victim, his very own son, come in human flesh. And at Calvary, turning away God's justified wrath against us by covering over our sins with his blood and by bearing in himself our sins in his body on the tree. And that is God's pleasure. God takes pleasure in his creatures, which is why he forgives us. And indeed, on Mount Sinai, immediately after Israel had sinned Israel's, if you like, her original sin, not the theological original sin, but if you like, in Israel's history, their original sin in the matter of the golden calf, immediately after Israel had done such a terrible thing, God revealed to Moses that it was God's glory to forgive. And that should simply amaze us. But that's God's pleasure. It's God's pleasure. Whereas in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32, God says that he takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. God would rather that we turn and live. And that brings us to the second divine pleasure in Psalm 85. God takes pleasure in repentant people, which is why he speaks to us. God takes pleasure in repentant people, which is why he speaks to us. In verse 8, the psalmist says, Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. And here, hearing is the key. Because in Old Testament parlance, quite literally, to hear is to obey. Only the obedience that the Old Testament uh, calls for is never a mechanical obedience. It's always obedience. 
that flows from hearts renewed by faith. But the people to whom God speaks, the people whose ears are to be open, these are people who previously had turned away from God and towards folly. And I want us to park our thoughts for a moment on what that word folly means. The word for folly is like the name of one of the two women presented to us in the book of Proverbs. On the one hand, there is lady wisdom, but on the other hand is the woman folly. And Proverbs chapter 9 describes the latter. It says, the woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. And she offers these passers-by illicit pleasures. She says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But we're warned that those who enter her house die, and that all her guests end up in the depths of the grave. And that's exactly the experience of the prodigal son. In the far country, the prodigal son wasted his inheritance on the pleasures offered to him by the woman folly. And when she had consumed all of his money, she kicked him out. And he had to go and live among the pigs. And that's our natural condition. Until our ears are opened by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, and we begin to listen to the voice of Lady Wisdom, our hearts are stupid, and we turn aside to the house of the woman Folly, where we die. We die a death of which God says, I take no pleasure in it, because God's pleasure is not in the death of wicked people. God's pleasure is in repentance and restoration. And because that's God's pleasure, God speaks to us through Lady Wisdom, and He speaks to us a message of peace. Our sins have separated us from God, but while we are still in the far country of our rebellion, living in the pigsty, of our sin, God sends to us an embassy of peace, and God promises us peace if we'll come home to Him. And that's what the preaching of the gospel is. It's God speaking peace to His people. It's the voice of the Father heard in the conscience of the prodigal that stirs up the lost son and resolves him to get on his feet and to go home. Which, if you think about it, is remarkable. Because who will the young man meet when he gets home? He will meet the one person in all the world he has most deeply offended. He will meet the one person in all the world with the right to reject him and to cast him out, to speak words of loss and death over him, to actually confirm that the prodigal is lost and dead, to say to him, as far as I am concerned, you're dead. As far as I am concerned, you're lost forever. That's the authority of the man that the prodigal is going home to. So I hope you see that it is quite remarkable that he gets on his feet and goes. The son knows this. But all the same, he says, I will arise 
and go to my father. So here's a question. Why is that not a gamble? Why is the young man not taking a risk? Sounds like a risk to us. What if my father rejects me? That sounds like a risk, but it's not a risk. It's not a gamble. Why so? Well, it's because the young man knows in his heart what sort of father his father is. It's his father's heart. Sorry, it's his father's voice speaking in his conscience that the young man hears, that persuades the young man to get up and go home. The father is already speaking peace to his son before ever the son returns home. And when his son does return, the joy that his father expresses is in character, is in keeping with the father. Listen to Jesus. Jesus says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. And the question is, who is rejoicing in heaven? The answer is, God is rejoicing in heaven. It's his pleasure to restore the repentant. Jesus says, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And the question is, who is rejoicing before the angels of God? They're not the ones rejoicing. It is God himself. It's God's pleasure to speak peace in our hearts. And so it's the father in the parable who says, let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's God's pleasure, to receive repenting people. And because that's his pleasure, he speaks peace within our hearts. Deep within our conscience, God speaks peace to us. He makes the words of the gospel go deeper than our conscience, deeper than our understanding, deeper than our desires. In the very recesses of our being, the Holy Spirit persuades us. It's as though God said to the Spirit, comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. And the Spirit receives that commission from God, if you like. And He speaks words of comfort deep within our being. He brings the free offer of the gospel to bear so directly upon us that it's just as though God himself were speaking peace to us. And hearing the voice of God, we live. And when we live, we get up on our feet and we go home and we say, Father, I have sinned against you. But our Father meets us with a smile because he is delighted. His pleasure is in people who repent. And that pleasure then issues in the third and final divine pleasure in Psalm 85. God takes pleasure in bringing harmony, which is why he has come among us in person. God takes pleasure in bringing harmony, not sending harmony, but bringing harmony, which is why he has come among us in person. Look at verses 9 to 13. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, God, sorry, yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. And this is a vision 
of the peace that God speaks to his people. It's a vision of the favor that he shows when he restores the captives to his land. And more than simply the cessation of hostilities, it is, says Derek Kidner, a vision of concord, vast, unspoilt, and rich with life. A vision of concord, vast, unspoilt, and rich with life. It's like a good marriage. It's the marriage of heaven and earth. Not because they are opposites to be reconciled, but because they are partners who are to live, designed to live, in fruitful harmony. This is a picture of paradise restored. This is a picture of creation attaining the end for which it was made, which is the display of the divine glory. Just as the psalm says, it's so that glory may dwell in our land. Literally, so that glory may tabernacle in our land. John chapter 1 verse 14 picks up on that phrase when it says that the divine glory became visible when the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. John even uses a Greek word that sounds a bit like the Hebrew word for tabernacled because God really did come and dwell among us in person. And he did so precisely because it is his pleasure to bring harmony. So don't think about glory and steadfast love and faithfulness and so on as though they were impersonal qualities. They're not impersonal qualities. These are divine perfections. These are the life of God, and He is the living God. He is fully alive. And in the communion of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God is perfectly harmonious. He is at perfect peace and rest, and He rejoices in His own harmony, and God's joy in His own harmony is fullness of joy. And here then is the thing that the gospel proclaims. What the gospel proclaims is that it is God's pleasure to bring us also into the enjoyment of His harmony and to do so in person. The psalm hints at this in its closing words. Righteousness will go before him, before the Lord, and make his way, make his footsteps away. And again, we're not to think about righteousness here as an impersonal quality, but rather as a divine perfection. Righteousness is God Himself in the glory of His perfect justice, walking to and fro in His land, in and out among His people personally bestowing on us the goodness and the fruitfulness that the psalm promises. That's why Jesus came the first time, so that by dying and rising again, He might come to us as He came to His disciples on the evening of the day of resurrection, and He breathed on them, and He said to them, "'Receive the Holy Spirit.'" God, the Holy Spirit, who communicates the life of God to us through the glorified incarnate Son. That's why Jesus came the first time, to give us that gift, the gift of life. And it's why He will come in person the second time, to raise our human natures up completely under the influence of the Spirit, so that by perfecting our whole human being under the influence of the Spirit, we might also perfect, or He might also perfect, our enjoyment of the fellowship of God, the harmony that Kidner says is vast, unspoilt, 
and rich with life. It's just as though the Holy Spirit himself were speaking to us in the words of 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. These are, of course, the words of John. But it's as though this was also, and it is also, the words of the Holy Spirit. So that the Spirit says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And that's what God wants. That's God's pleasure. Personally, to bring us deeper and deeper and deeper into the enjoyment of His own harmony. So every time sin whispers in your ear that God is ungenerous and severe, a penny-pinching, grudge-bearing God, a God to be avoided at all costs. Every time sin insinuates that in your ear, reread Psalm 85 and take the words of the psalm to heart. For in Psalm 85, God is revealed as a God who takes pleasure in His creatures, which is why He doesn't abandon us in the far country of our rebellion and our lost condition amongst the pigs, but rather goes to great lengths to provide for us the forgiveness of our sins. That's God's pleasure. And read in Psalm 85 about a God who takes pleasure in people who repent, which is why before ever we repent, God speaks words of peace to us through the gospel and deep within the recesses of our being. And read in Psalm 85 about a God who takes pleasure in bringing harmony. Indeed, whose deepest pleasure is in personally bringing us into the enjoyment of His own triune life. Amen. Let's bow in prayer. We want to begin, gracious God, confessing that we have been inclined to listen to the lies of sin, the things that sin tells us about you, how it makes you out to be hard, ungenerous, severe, when in reality you're a God of grace, overflowing in love, a compassionate God, a God who is slow to anger, a God who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, a God who made us for himself, and who made us so that our hearts would not have peace until we came to enjoy true peace in you. Thank you that every page of Scripture bears witness to this. Thank you that you have borne witness to this through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of your Son. Thank you that you continue to bear witness to this by your Spirit deep within our being. Please transform us by the knowledge of this. Please grant by your grace that we may continue to believe the gospel. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close by singing Psalm 85, and we're using version A of the psalm and singing the whole psalm. Psalm 85a, Lord, you showed favor to your land, and Jacob's fortunes did restore. Your people's sin you did forgive, and their wrongdoing covered sure. 
You set aside your rage that burned and from your heated anger turned. Then faithfulness will spring from earth, from heaven righteousness looks down. Yes, good to us the Lord will give. Our land will yield its harvest then. True righteousness will him proceed and make a path his steps to lead. Psalm 85a, the whole psalm, let's stand and sing to God's praise. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Son and Spirit be with you all. Amen.